Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or have been in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please punch that subscribe button and then punch its little brother the notification bell. Make sure that one is set to all so you don't miss every time I upload, which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down in the description box below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, I've been getting messages about people watching my videos and there's like 18 ads in there. I always place my ads after the opening, after the first story, and that is it. So I only place two in all of my stories. If in fact there are that many ads within the video, please know that that is Google doing that, not me. But, if you seem to have issues with it, please let me know. Before I get on with the stories, I must give a very special shout out to Amy Klimko. When I did the video of the Elite Members' choices, I accidentally looked over Amy Klimko. It just so happens her choice was Let's Not Meet. So Amy, I'm sorry, and I hope you enjoy the video. This happened a few months ago in the summer when I had just moved to a new house. There was a community pool just down the road and the day after we moved in, I went there with some friends. But after an hour or so, I decided to go home because it was just way too hot. As I walked out of the pool's parking lot, a car also pulled out of it and stopped right next to me. The driver shouted something out to me, but I couldn't hear what he said. So, being stupid, I went closer to see what he wanted. Are you that new girl who just moved into that redacted house number? I was confused, but again, being stupid, I said, Yeah? He told me that he just dropped his girlfriend's kids off at the pool and was just on his way home when he saw me. He offered to give me a lift home. He might have been my neighbor, but he was also a stranger in a car. I've never met him before, and there was no way I was getting in, even if there was air con. I told him, thanks, but I'm all right, and kept on walking. He then said something that I still think is bizarre, and I don't know if it was a tactic of some sort, but he asked me if I at least wanted some candy. I was tired, I was hot, and it was the most stranger danger cliche I have ever heard in my life. So I told him, I'm 17, I don't want your damn candy. As soon as I said that, he apologized to me. Oh, I thought you were the younger one. And finally drove away. Now immediately this put me on edge because I took that comment to mean that he was probably talking to me because he thought I was younger, which made my skin crawl. I also don't even know who he was talking about because I have a twin and a younger sister, and he even thought I was 17. I look way younger. I told my stepdad about what had happened, but he just played it off as me being paranoid. But I made sure that I told both my sisters, and they also thought it was creepy as hell. I actually didn't want to share this story because I felt like there might be an innocent explanation to it, and I am just being paranoid. But I really don't know how I feel. Like, maybe he has some bad intentions. So, creepy guy in your car van wanting to give a 17-year-old candy. I hope we never, ever meet again. So, my wife and I backpack or hike a lot. 
the more remote the place, the better. In 2015, my wife and I were in the Bitterroot Wilderness of Montana. We had been out for two weeks on a 100-mile route, finding trails we kind of connected together on a few topo maps to make a loop. We had seen only one other person, Tom. We met him on our second day in and his last day out. He told us he hadn't seen or ran into anyone out there. So, as far as we all knew, we are going to be alone out there. He did tell us hunting season was weeks away, but there might be scouts out. To be careful with our food, where we eat, and our scent because it's bear country and we had seen a few and even one with cubs. He also mentioned that he had heard cougars in the distance, but that we should be okay as long as we stick together. We camped together that night, and the next morning, we thanked him for his company, all the info, and parted ways. For two weeks, we hiked, saw some cool vistas, swam, saw, and heard wildlife, and all the stuff you'd expect to see in the backcountry. We didn't really think about Tom again until after a few days out and hadn't seen anyone. We took the thought of being alone for granted and let our guard down. As far as other people we concerned, we were all alone out there. We are in our last few days out, winding the trip down, sauntering back to the trailhead, just taking it all in. We find a nice flat tent site, make a fire, eat some dinner, hang our food bag, and walk back to our tent for the night and pass a good night's sleep. The next morning, as backpackers do, we break camp as early as possible, get some breakfast and coffee into us, and before we leave camp, I need it to drop a deuce. So I venture away from the tent site to find a suitable spot. As I'm walking around to find a spot to dig my cat hole, I come up on a lumped up thing looking like a bush. I was not expecting to run into anyone out there as we had only seen one other person early on and no one else since. I wasn't paying attention as I'm looking for somewhere to shit and not looking out for people. These two are in a camo blind type of wrap. I didn't realize that they were there, and they didn't hear me or realize that I had walked up on them until the last goddamn minute because I was right on top of them, dripping over one of their legs. They scared the ever-living shit out of me, and I scared the shit out of them. (laughs) No pun intended. (laughs) When I hit the guy's leg, I startled him. He kind of jumped up, knocking their blind off of their big revile. The guy was on his knees, has a dick in hand apparently, blowing the other guys that's up against the tree. Now, the guy on his knees is looking at me dead in my eyes with a look of, what the fuck, who are you? Ah, fuck, I'm caught. My sight is going back and forth from Hunter, Dick, Hunter, Dick, Hunter. The guy standing yells at me. What the fuck are you doing, man? They scramble, one trying to stand up, the other pulling his pants up. All the while, both are fighting the fucking blind that wrapped in between them. Me in disbelief of what I just came up on. Just stood there for what felt like forever. I stumbled over my words to find an apology and end up blurting out, Nothing, guys. Uh, I'm sorry. Man, have fun. And turned back to my camp in a almost run. They yelled at me to stop, but I didn't. Fucking longest 200-yard sprint ever. Got back to camp. My wife looked at me and instantly knew something had happened, and asked what was up. I told her to grab her stuff, and we hurried out of there without a word. About half an hour later of sprint hiking, we had to stop. I still hadn't took a dump, and I had to go, like, now. 
So we took a spurred trail to break, snack, and tell her what happened. She told me she was worried and that I scared her. She was scared the entire time thinking I had been chased by a bear or cougar or something, and it was after us. I told her nothing like that, that it was just two hunters hiding out and blowing each other. We talked a bit about it. She asked if I thought if they'd look for us. I told her I didn't think so, that they probably left after being caught. If they were upset, yeah, they yelled at me, wanting to know what the fuck I was doing. If we should just make it back to the car and leave. No, let's wait them out, just in case they are on the trailhead waiting. Like I said, we've been out for about two weeks now, and we have been making our way back and are less than a day's hike from the trailhead at this point. So they must have gone out after being caught, right? After a while of talking it over, we kind of just chuckled it off and hiked on to the creek where we are going to camp for the night. We made camp off trail in a nice outcrop with no incident. Next morning, we wake up break camp down, do our morning routine, and hike out to the trailhead. With that, we're not really thinking of the two hunters anymore. Well, as we get to the trailhead, we meet two ladies that had been prepping breakfast and now cleaning up. As we are walking to the parking lot, they chat us up with the usual backcountry questions. Of how long have we been out? How many miles did we do? Did we see any bears? What did we eat? Then, almost at the same time, one lady offered up some of their leftover food as the other gal starts yelling, Hey, Abby, these two have been hiking up on that same trail you and -and so-and-so were just out on yesterday, but they were out for like two weeks. Bring them some of that real food and juice. Hubby pokes his head out of their camper to say hi. Lo and behold, it's the fucking hunter that was against the tree. His smile faded as quick as his face turned white, then to an angry look when he realized who he's looking at. Then his buddy, the giver, turns the damn corner from their trailer to see me standing right there. I feel the blood just drain from my body, and these guys face turns from happy go lucky to disbelief and fear at the sight of me the wife then asked if we happened on their husbands out there as they were out scouting for game yesterday as i'm stumbling my words they are darting their looks from me to themselves before i can say anything my wife is answering yes we'd love some real food no we hadn't seen anyone You guys are the first ones we've seen in two weeks. The wife turns to the hunters and say, You guys must have had a real good hiding spot. Cheese and fucking rice. I think both the hunters and me had a mini heart attack. One of the guys just gives a nod. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I can't imagine the, the face. That... <laughs> Back to our story. Sorry. My wife and I graciously take our pancakes and fucking sausage of all goddamn things. I can see the hunters quietly talking to each other, staring over at me every once in a while. I am doing my best to avoid the situation by packing up the car. While my wife is thanking the hunter's wives for the food, both fucking hunters with sidearms on their hip, mind you, come up to me with a beer. The one that was on the tree kind of pushed it into my chest and asked if I had seen anything out there. My heart freaking stopped. I again stumbled over my words. Uh... Other than um, some wild animals, <laughs> nothing worth writing home about. Yeah, we didn't see much either, but we are really surprised you didn't hear us last night walk through your camp. Be careful. 
You never know what can happen out there, especially in the middle of the woods. After a few seconds, the other one just smirks and they run to leave with a, have a safe trip home. I wasn't sure what was going on in that moment, so I was psyching myself up for a fight. I was kind of shooken up as we were leaving the trailhead. My wife asked if I was okay and if those were the guys I had seen. My reply was, yeah, what the fuck do you think, babe? And then asked what they said to me. I told her I thought I was going to have a fight then, but that they just gave me a beer to buy my silence. I didn't mention the passive-aggressive threat they made about walking through our camp. I'm going to start out to say this isn't some flashy, scary story, and it doesn't have the most satisfying ending, but none got hurt, which I am extremely grateful for. Here's my story. This all happened when I was in like grade five or six. I'm Canadian, so we have primary school, kindergarten to grade A. High school is grade nine to grade 12th and 13th, then college or university. So I would have been around eight or nine years old at the time. I'm now, as of writing this, 23 years old, getting ready to be 24 in July. So my memory may be a bit foggy, but what happened this day will forever stand out to me. I and my sister, who was two years younger than me, we're going to call her Paya, went to a little French immersion school growing up. At the time, we were not living close to it, so we had to take a school bus. The bus stop where we would be picked up in the morning and dropped off in the afternoon was about a block or so away from the apartment buildings we lived in. My sister and I would get up at 7 a.m. and catch the bus that runs at 7.30 a.m. to get to school for 8 a.m. There was another family that also caught the bus at our stop with some younger children, so we were never fully alone. But my sister and I made the walk there and home without an adult because my mother worked nights and my sister and I thought we were old enough to walk the short distance alone. This is important later. This all happened during late spring, I think around April or May, when the weather was getting consistently hotter during the day, upwards of 20 degrees Celsius. Again, important later. I should also note that I have allergenic asthma, which means activities like running or strenuous exercise as well as allergens like pollen can and will trigger my asthma. For this reason, I wasn't a big runner, and seeing me run was a rare occurrence. So, in the morning, I'm not a morning person and never have been. Bright and early at 7.15 a.m., my sister and I head out to go wait at the bus stop for the school bus. Everything was pretty normal, me being the more obviously tired one of us all, but something stuck out to me. I noticed an old brown pickup truck parked in one of the driveways of a nearby house. A person sat in the driver's seat, seemingly doing nothing. Maybe sleeping? I don't know. This wouldn't have been weird except I knew the people there drove a minivan. Maybe it was just how ugly the color of the brown pickup was, but it stuck out to me. In hindsight, I should have questioned why the guy in the truck just sat there in his vehicle for over 15 minutes doing nothing, and I was too tired to care. Off to school we went, and the day was honestly forgettable in how routine it was. On the bus to go home, however, my sister and I got into an argument, so when we got to our stop, Paya took off running back to the house ahead of me, leaving me with the parents who picked up their younger children at the stop. And then, after they left, I was alone. 
I was not impressed by the stunt my sister had pulled and began to walk down the street with traffic near me, going the same way I was walking. I was about a minute into my walk home when I noticed that brown pickup truck that looked oddly familiar. I hadn't realized it was probably the one from earlier that morning, slowing down beside me as I walked. Now, it was a pretty hot day out. One kid had collapsed during recess because of heat stroke, so I was having a hard time already due to the heat. The driver of this old brown pickup rolls down the passenger side window to talk to me, waving a hand at me to get me to stop. I do stop because I was raised to be polite, but I kept my distance. The patch of grass separated the curb and the sidewalk, meaning I had at least 60 centimeters of space between me and the curb. Hey there, kiddo. Where are you headed? The driver, a man in his late 50s or so, asked. Now, I had been raised knowing all about stranger danger, so I was already on guard about this. Home, I told him, purposefully vague about it. At this point, the man leaned over and unlocked the passenger door, and I was able to see him just a little better. He had a tattoo of what I think was a tiger and some other animals on his upper right arm. He wore a plain gray muscle shirt. I couldn't see what kind of pants he was wearing because I was short. His hair was a salt and pepper of gray and black, pulled into a low, greasy ponytail. And he had a mustache. Not to profile, but like one of those stereotypical pedo stashes. His skin tone was tan, but he seemed to be Caucasian and his hands were large with a scar across his knuckles. How about you hop in and I'll give you a ride? It's pretty hot out here today. This complete stranger offered me with a smile and I noticed he seemed to have a missing tooth. I, of course, smiled back to not be rude and simply said a polite, No, thank you, sir and started walking again. Now, this would have been fine and dandy if it had just ended at that, but instead, he began keeping pace with me in his truck and insisting that I get in, that it was too hot out and yada yada, and that all the other kids had been picked up. Now, this struck me as odd, and still does even now, because this meant... He had been watching when all of us had gotten off the bus. Though I guess he didn't notice my sister run off, but still, this was really creepy. I again said, no thank you, but he didn't seem to take that hint. In fact, he became more pushy and maybe a little irritated. He had pulled up so close to the curb, he was almost jumping it with his pickup truck now. And at this point, I was really feeling scared that this man might do something I would not like. So I quickly said, have a nice day, sir. And then took off running as fast as I could towards my apartment complex. I vaguely heard him shout something at me, but I just kept running, cutting over the grassy hill with a few trees on it instead of staying on the sidewalk. I saw that someone had just left the underground parking area that connected two of the main buildings and ran in it just before the big door that lets cars out closed. I didn't stop running until I made it up to the eighth floor, got into my house and slammed and locked the door. At this point, I was in full-blown asthma attack as well as crying in fear. I collapsed against the door, hyperventilating and sobbing, and my sister was now freaking out at how I just bursted in like that. But I couldn't get out what I was trying to say, as I could barely breathe. Eventually, I was able to calm down. My mother then came home from what she had been doing, and I was able to explain what had happened. My mother then called the police, and we had a female officer come interview me, to whom I recounted only what had happened on my way home from the bus stop. 
I didn't put it together that he had probably been watching us earlier that morning as well until later. And a nice policewoman took my statement. Unfortunately, nothing ever came of the investigation, and it didn't help that I couldn't remember the license plate other than it looked like it wasn't from Ontario, Canada, which in hindsight is even scarier to me. So I never really heard anything after that. But to the man who may or may not have tried to kidnap me in your van while I was walking home from school, let's not ever meet again. A bunch of years ago, I matched with a guy on Tinder. I was a freshman in college and just got out of a relationship and having fun. I met with this guy. He was 24. We will call him D. He was a little odd, but we had similar interests and went to the same school, so I thought, hmm, why not? The red flag started rolling in immediately when I said I would go on a date with him. Of course, the fact that he was much older isn't lost on me as the initial red flag. At this time, I didn't have a car. D offers to pick me up, but tells me that he is not in town, but he would leave his grandmother's funeral early, which was a minimum five hours away, to come and pick me up. He showed up in sweatpants, a wife beater, and flip-flops which struck me as odd because he said he was coming from a funeral. We hadn't made plans just to go get a bite to eat and hang out. Since he had been out of town, he asked if it was okay if we stopped to pick up his dog. He had left the dog with a friend. I like dogs, so I was like, hey, no problem. It's dark and we pull up to a apartment complex and he leaves me in the car and comes back with a golden retriever. The dog immediately starts growling at me, which had never happened to me before, so I start feeling a little weird. D doesn't say anything about the dog's temperament. Because we have the dog, he wants to drop him off at the house first. This feels logical to me, so I agree. When we pulled up to D's house, he asks if I want to come in, not wanting to sit in the car, I do. The moment I walked in, I immediately knew it was the wrong choice. The house is trash. There's garbage everywhere. Trash bags full along the front entry. Bottles and wrappers on the couch and just general shit everywhere. D lets me know he has a roommate, but that roommate isn't home. I assume this is to imply the mess isn't his. After brushing the trash off the couch, he asked if I want to sit and play chess. I had expressed that I was interested in learning, and he seemed more than happy to help me learn. This, too, was a mistake. D begins explaining the game to me, and it is a fun first date explaining. He has gotten very serious and is showing me each piece while telling me what it is what it does, and how it moves. D then begins questioning me over each piece, which mostly I get wrong. Every time I get one wrong, he yells at me the correct answer and tells me to try again. I got more and more frustrated, and it made me very uncomfortable, so I suggested we pause chess and do something else. D suggests watching a movie, which is fine with me. The idea of us leaving and going to get food seemingly, I guess, got forgotten. D tells me that we can watch a movie in his room and I oblige. But then he explains that he has to put clean sheets on the bed. I had assumed we were moving to his bedroom because it may have been cleaner. But when we go in it, it's not. And there is no TV in his room. He proceeds to put Iron Man 2 onto his phone to have us watch. We watched about 10 minutes of it before things got sexual. I won't tell you strangers the details, but short story short, 
we didn't have sex, but other things went down. I will say those things were consensual. After they occurred, I was feeling really odd about the whole situation and told him I didn't want to have sex. D was confused but didn't push it at first. He said fine and we watched maybe five more minutes of the movie before he said he didn't want to watch the movie anymore. He started complaining and asking me why I didn't want to have sex with him and I simply said I wasn't in the mood anymore. He then began pressuring me to tell him exactly what it was about him that made me feel that way. At this point, we had moved from the bedroom back into the dirty living room. You might be thinking, seems like a perfect time to leave, and I thought so too, but this is where things start to get scary. As if he knows I'm thinking about how I'm leaving, he explodes and begins to scream at me. This is a six foot something man screaming in the face of a five foot nothing young girl. Of course, I'm internally freaking out, but I'm trying to make sure I don't piss him off anymore, but also not agreeing to anything. For the next five to ten minutes, D screams at me about why I don't like him, why I don't want him, and continuously asks what's wrong with him and to tell him. I tried to placate him as best as possible, saying the old, it's not you, it's me, and no, I don't want to leave. Again, this man is my only ride home, and I'm truthfully not sure exactly where I was. Though I did have my phone and Google Maps, I did not have Uber at the time. D finally calms down when he believes I'm going to stay, then suggests we try playing some video games. I was in full internal freak mode, trying to make sure I was playing the part of the interested date because I was terrified that if he felt I wanted to leave, he would freak out again. We played this game for a while, then out of nowhere, D starts getting upset again. He started yelling about why no one likes him, why no one wants to get to know him, and why no one loves him saying that he has never had a girlfriend and all his dates have been one-night stands. Again, I placate him with a, I, I don't know, lots of girls are just snooty like that. At this point, I'm saying anything and everything he wants to hear. He even starts crying about how his mother never loved him and telling me very deep, dark things about what his mother has said to him and how she treated him. After he finally calms down once more, he gets up and goes to the kitchen to fix us some drinks. Now, if you're anyone with a brain, you're thinking absolutely not, which was my exact thought at that moment. I decline his multiple offers for a drink. He asks if instead of alcohol, I wanted water, and of course I decline that too, feigning that I wasn't thirsty. I stayed at his apartment and until about 1 a.m. because I was uh, sitting next to him terrified, so one, ask him to take me home, two, say I'd walk home, or three, figure out how to get an Uber. I had been trying to download Uber on my phone without him noticing, and then it asks for card information, and that was way too hard to do with him noticing. So, at around 1 a.m., I yawn very loudly and say, Oh, wow, it's 1 a.m. My roommates are going to be so worried about me. I laugh as if my roommates would be stupid to worry and that I hadn't been watching the clock since he picked me up at 9 p.m. Then said, I'm so tired. I should get home soon. Again, I was super scared he would freak out, but he didn't explode. He just looked at the clock and said, Yeah, it was late, but I was not taking any chances. So I said, I have a great idea. If I get to bed soon, I'd love to have breakfast with you on campus. 
I was hoping my offer convinced him that I was intending to see him again. And it did. He seemed very happy at the prospect of it and jumped up, walking me out of his house and to his car. The drive back was excruciatingly long. The ride was completely silent. Neither of us spoke. It was only a 10-minute drive, but I could have sworn he slowed down every time we got to a particularly dark area or an underpass. D dropped me off, and I smiled and made a good show of being tired yet excited to see him tomorrow. He offered multiple times to walk me to my door, but I declined every time and said I didn't want to bother him and I'd see him tomorrow. I walked myself to the building, and the moment I got around the corner, I sprinted so fast up the stairs into my door before he could change his mind and follow me to my door. When I got in my dorm room, I genuinely felt like I had just escaped a serial killer. Even now, writing this makes my heart race. I never met with him, but... He bugged me for multiple days after to meet up again. He even asked to pay me $20 an hour just to sit near me in the library. I declined, obviously, and only ever saw him once after at the gym on my campus. He didn't see me, and I left immediately. I've thought about D occasionally since the date and wondered if all those girls he had one-night stands with had the same experience I did. I still sometimes wonder how many girls there were after me. So, D, let's not ever meet again. Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. This first started happening 15 years ago and would take place over the next 13 years of my life. It all started in the summertime, about four months after we had moved to a new house in a different state. I was nine years old at the time, and I didn't really have any friends in the area. One day, I was out in the front yard helping my dad with yard work. He would mow the front and back yards, and I would either pick up dandelions out of the ground or water the pints at the front of the house. Not super helpful, I know, but I was nine years old and wasn't allowed to do anything with the lawnmower, besides maybe pull the cord to start the motor. My dad had just finished the front yard and had mowed his way to the backyard while I stayed in the front yard to finish up. I remember seeing a package on the porch in front of our door and going to pick it up. And that was when I turned around and saw him. A man in his late thirties with long dark hair tied into a ponytail, hanging down past his shoulders, wearing a plain white t-shirt, black pajama pants, and no socks or shoes. He was standing at the end of the street standing with his arms crossed and staring directly at me. Now, for context, my house is four houses down from the end of the street. At the end of my street, there is a road that forms a T-shaped intersection. On the other side of this intersection from my house, there were three houses, with one house lined up in the middle of my street and the other two houses sitting to the right of it. To the left of the house lined up with my street is an old steel treating factory that existed, surrounded by houses in our neighborhood, and, at that time, was still active 24-7. This man was standing in front of the house lined up with my street at the top of the T-shaped intersection. He was standing right off the edge of the street and in front of what I assumed was his house, just staring at me. As soon as I saw him, I immediately froze and stared back at him, with a sudden uneasy feeling washing over me. The longer I looked at him, the more red flags I began to notice. To my nine-year-old mind, this man was dressed very strangely, 
and that had already been an immediate red flag. But the creepiest thing that stood out to me was his face. His face had absolutely no expression of any kind. There was just this intense and piercing stare with him, looking directly at me. It felt like he was staring straight through me, and for at least two minutes, we stared at each other, never looking away or even blinking. Eventually, the uneasy feeling built up enough for me to slowly walk myself down off the porch and over to the side of our house, never looking away from the man. When I made it out of sight, I ran to the backyard to tell my dad what had just happened. I came up to him as he finished mowing the backyard and described what I had seen, and that was when he told me that he had seen this man the other day doing the same thing, except just staring straight down our street. Arms crossed, plain white t-shirt, pajama pants, no shoes, just like when I had seen him. After that, my dad told me that he thought that man seemed a little off and to stay far, far away from him. Unfortunately, that would not be the last time that I saw the man at the end of our street. From that point on, I would see this man much more often. I would be riding in the car with my family or outside doing something in our yard or on our block, and I would look over and see him standing in the same spot, arms crossed, intensely staring. He wasn't there 24-7, but at least three days a week, I would see him outside, sometimes for five or more hours at a time. If not staring at me, he was staring at someone walking their dog or a car passing by. Once I tried to figure out his schedule, so I wouldn't have to be around him as much. But it felt too creepy. Just keeping track of him because he would occasionally start scanning his head around looking for people to lock on to, which really creeped me out. Now, some of you may be thinking... He's just staring and not doing anything. That's not that bad, right? Well, sadly, I would later find out that things were far worse than I had ever imagined. So, fast forward about nine years. I'm now 18 years old and looking to get a job to save up for my first car. I hadn't really been able to save any money up to that point, and my parents weren't in any position to be able to help me with purchasing one. So I knew that I had to try and find a job that would be easy for me to get to and that would pay me enough for me to hopefully get a cheap car quickly. Lo and behold, the still treating factory next to the creepy man's house has a now hiring sign out front and I decided that a two-minute walk to work had to be worth it, even if it meant walking by Creepy Man's house. I had seen this guy doing this routine for almost a decade at this point and figured that it wasn't going to be a problem. So I apply and end up getting the job. It was hard work, which usually consisted of heavy physical labor and keeping a constant pace, but nothing I hadn't expected. I started off fairly slowly, but ended up getting much better and able to do tasks much faster. About three months in, I was assigned to work on a machine that I had not previously worked on, located in the loading dock. From the loading dock, I had a clear view of the wooden fence that separated the factory loading zone from the creepy man's house, as well as the front of his driveway, where he would normally stand. I couldn't see the man standing at this point, but I was able to notice a large hole in the fence, which seemed like it had been made in some kind of accident. The fence was not broken cleanly, but there were splinters and cracks in the fence when the hole had been made. I asked the floor worker who was with me at the dock, I'll just call him Ronnie, if he knew anything about this, and this actually got us into a longer conversation about the creepy man. 
Ronnie had been with the still treating factory for over 15 years and had seen the guy during his staring routine more than once. According to Ronnie, the hole in the fence had been made by Creepy Man and he had told the managers of the plant that it had been an accident with his truck. But that's not all. Ronnie went on to tell me that creepy neighbor guy actually runs a daycare out of his house and that it was an unregistered business and has actually led to police being called on him more than once. This surprised me as I had never seen the police over at his house before, but after Ronnie told me this, something else occurred to me. When looking at Creepy Man's house, whenever his van wasn't sitting in the driveway, you could see one of those children's mini playgrounds with a slide and toys built onto it The kind toddlers would love to play with. This always struck me as odd because never once in those nine years up to that point had I ever seen anybody else come or go from his house, especially not any children. But I had never really dedicated much thought into it. After Ronnie told me this, I thought back to when I had first seen him as a nine-year-old and all the other times he had stared at me growing up. And I began to wonder if he had been secretly plotting to try and get me over to his unofficial daycare. Sadly, I couldn't really confirm what Ronnie had told me. And at this point, I had been dealing with my own personal problems at home. And so I just filed the story into the back of my head as something I would not at all be surprised to find out was true. I left that job not long after this. I'd saved up the money I needed for a car and was able to make my way into the career field I had been hoping to make it into. Fast forward to three years later and to one of the scariest things that has ever happened to me and the reason for this story. At this point, I had moved away from home, but ended up having to move back home with my parents for reasons I'm not going to get into. I had also met my girlfriend, and we would spend some nights driving over to my parents' house to watch old movies or play games with my janky basement setup. By this point, my girlfriend was aware of the creepy man, but paid him as much mind as anybody else. As creepy as he was, he wasn't breaking the law by standing there, and our lives already had too much going on for us to be focusing our time and attention on this weirdness. On this night, I was driving home with my girlfriend for a normal night of watching movies. I didn't want to block my mother's car in on our single lane driveway, so I had recently started parking in the grass patch behind our house. Behind our house was an alley that ran past everybody's backyard. Our backyard had a wooden fence up against the alley with a separate garage building which opened up into the alley. I had started to park in the grass patch area in between the garage doors and the alley more often. And so that was the direction I had been driving home. Silently hoping to myself that the creepy man wouldn't be outside on a pleasant night like this. Well, of course, I had jinxed it. And the way home that I was going ended up taking us right past him, standing and staring us down. I locked eyes with him very briefly as we drove past him, headed to the right side of the T intersection to turn into the alley to go behind my house. But here's where things got scary. For some reason, I don't know why, as we passed by the creepy man, I got a really bad feeling. A feeling very similar to the day I had first seen him. A gut-wrenching, something-is-wrong kind of feeling. And so I decided to look into my driver's side mirror. To my horror, the greedy man had actually left his post and started walking quickly in my direction. I can honestly say that this 
was the first time I had ever seen that creepy guy not standing completely still. And here he was, walking the same direction I had gone. As my thoughts started racing, I turned into the alleyway and then went four houses down, turning into the grass patch behind the garage in our backyard. I immediately told my girlfriend what I had seen and how strange it was. I did not want to freak her out, but I didn't want her to get blindsided if something bad was about to happen. From the angle that my car was parked, I could turn around in my driver's seat and stare at the alleyway through the slits in the wooden fence in our backyard. I would be able to see if he was coming and see if he rounded the corner. I locked my car doors, turned in my seat, and reached into the pocket to tightly grip my pocket knife. My eyes widened and my heart started beating fast as I saw him casually walking down the alley through the slits, right up to the edge of the wooden fence, and then pause. After a few moments, he turned around 180 degrees and started walking back down the alley in the direction he had just come from. I waited about two minutes before getting out of my car and slowly approaching the edge of the fence, then walking into the alley to see that he was gone. I have thought about this quite a bit since it happened two years ago. I don't actually know if he recognized me or the house that I had pulled into or why he would chase us that night to follow me and my girlfriend and scare the hell out of us. Honestly, I really don't give a shit. I was about to move out of that house shortly after that happened and I'm now living with my girlfriend who today is my fiance. But to the man that stared at me and my entire neighborhood for over half of my life and who followed me and my girlfriend into a dark alley for God knows what reason, let's never ever meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Sugared Spice, Samantha Blaze, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klemko, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. I know I say it a lot, but I can never say it enough. Thank each and every last one of you for supporting Back to Ashes. If there was no you, there would be no me, and there would be no Back to Ashes. So, from the bottom of my heart, always, thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.